you know, as we speak, there's a hostage crisis in Mali. 170 people are holed up in a, ho in a hotel. Uh, several have died. Uh, there's a raid going on. And in a few hours, this particular incident will have ended and the theater of war will have momentarily shifted somewhere else. In the last couple of weeks alone, there have been attacks in Beirut, in, in Syria, in Paris, in Ankara. Over the last two decades, our conversation, the global conversation has been dominated by the idea of terror and the war on terror. But that's one window into terror. Karuna's poem is about forgetting, it's about mindsets. And this session is to try and create another window into the fight against terror. Because as we bomb in retaliation, that is one route. But as, as, as uh, her poem just brought out and as the Mali situation right now again brings out, it's only that the theater keeps shifting. So this session is about the fact that can women play a special role in fighting back against terror? What is the mindset? Is there a way of retrieving that mindset from the vortex that it is being pulled into? When I first uh, discussed this session with Tina, we thought that we'd like to create it as a very positive session about women who are fighting back in different ways. But that would be a very simplistic construct as well. And today I have three extremely powerful women who have been working in the most difficult conflict zones in the world. And it is a mixed message that comes out. The women do have a role, but it is not always, <coughs> sorry. It is not always something that is simplistic and, and uh, antithetical to, m to the men's role in this entire uh, situation to do with terror. So what I really want to discuss right now is about forgetfulness, is about mindsets, and about the special role that women can or perhaps cannot play in fighting back on terror. I want to start with you, Obi. The entire focus right now is on ISIS. But two days ago, the, the terrorism index brought out the fact that the Boko Haram is actually more lethal than the ISIS. But the, but the assessment of that is just in statistics. You know that Boko Haram has killed 6,600 people, but ISIS has killed 6,100 people last year. But the fact is that the world has forgotten the 200 odd girls that were kidnapped. You're fighting to keep, uh, you know, to keep the memory of them alive, to, uh, to bring the fight, to bring them back. So I just wanted to ask you, is there a special role that women can play in this? And what is the reason that makes Boko Haram and Beirut more forgettable than Syria and Paris? Um, thank you very much. Um, the first one, is there a role that women can play? As far as, as, far as I know, um, men and women are the human capital that we have in the world. You cannot solve any problem effectively and efficiently in our world today by simply assembling men to solve them. We have a problem of terrorism. In order to tackle it, both the men and the women must come around the table and determine the many facets of solution. For one, I believe that there is so much indoctrination that has gone on. And this indoctrination has been laced over um, uh, environments, particularly in environments where there is a lack of opportunities. There's so much inequality. And then in some of the cases where you see those who had opportunity but are romantic about the matter of some ideology that is a mistaken one, uh, you find that it is because some nurturing was missing. So the role of the family has been completely decimated in man and, 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 and in the bead of humanity to run crazy for materialism, whether it's in the Western world or it's in the developing world, materialism enveloped us and in the process we lost the value systems. Once our values collapsed, we were bound to go downhill. That's what we're wrestling with. But we, you know, I was just saying that there's one approach to terror, which is to bomb back, to break the networks, uh, intelligence. You know, that's, that's the conversation that dominates the world. But you, in keeping alive the story of the, Boko Haram, the girls that were kidnapped by Boko Haram, have taken a different route. 
you know, you're trying to create a multi, you know, cross-cultural conversation. Can you can you discuss that, and has it helped in any way? So one of the things which, what what um, um, uh, my dear friend is referring to is the fact that as part of our advocacy, uh, we are looking even to the medium and longer term. And so we brought together the Catholic Archbishop of the capital city, Abuja, together with the chief imam of the mosque uh, in Abuja. And they became voices for uh, demanding that the girls be rescued. And the, the mere symbolism of these two leaders of religion coming together and saying that it is wrong for young women who went to acquire education to be taken away and for society to forget them. It was unbelievable. People responded to it significantly. The imam um, quoted very important sections of the Quran that said this is an abomination that children are being violated and that violence is being visited against women because they seek knowledge. And he asked every one of us to join him in saying that Education is not an abomination because Boko Haram means education is abomination. And, 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 and so he became a voice. And today what he's done is that every, every week at the mosque, he reinforces the message. Now, that might seem to be something too little. But the truth is, one more child that lives the lane of radicalism and enters the lane of humanity is a bonus to this world that we now know. A world that has put everybody on that thread. Yes. You know, before we move to Zainab, I, one, I want to say that we have very little time, which is why I'm going to race through this in ways that, you know, none of us are comfortable with. But I just want to share with you that one of the girls that was kidnapped by the Boko Haram, when she came back, she said, don't punish these boys, give them education and give them jobs. That, for a woman who had been raped and, you know, put through the kind of uh, stress, is an indication of the more humanitarian approach that can uh, redeem people, retrieve people, uh, rather than merely uh, uh, the approach of bombing. But it has to be, it has to be total. We cannot, there, there, there is a place for punishment of bad behavior. For too long, we allowed bad behavior to fester amongst us. And we all looked away. And bad behavior became the norm. We can't, we can't operate with that anymore. In all of our societies, people must find their voice and speak up against bad behavior. A friend of mine, Ellie Whistle, said that indifference is actually the opposite of hate. It's not the, oppo the opposite, opposite of love. It is not hate that is the opposite of love. It is indifference. It is enough time for the elite of this world to be indifferent. We can't afford to live in our mansions and think it will not come near us. We cannot buy any insurance against danger in today's world. We yes. must act together. Yes. Then I'm speaking about mindsets because, uh, you know, I totally agree with Obi that there has to be a pushback, uh, you know, empirical pushback uh, where it hurts and there is punishment. But we are also not just fighting the physical act of terror, we are fighting the mind. And that is something that I wanted you to talk about. Uh, what is this mindset? Can women play a particular role? You've started a TV show, you've worked across, you know, starting from Bosnia, you've worked in many conflict zones. Is there anything special that women can do? And the last question is, so much of this is emanating over interpretations of the Quran. You've said that mus this is a Muslim crisis and Muslims must own it. What can women, the Arab Spring women, women who stood up, how can they push back on this? You know, that's a lot of questions, but. Well, uh, Zainab, just one minute before you, there's, there's a little clip that shows a recruitment video by the, by the ISIS, and that gives some indication of the mindset that is driving this. So we'll just have a look at that. All my brothers living in the West, I know how you feel when I used to live there. In the heart, you feel depressed, 
Hmm? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the cure for the depression is jihad fi sabirillah. You feel like you have no honor. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the honor of a believer is qiyamul layl. Eh? The honor of the Ummah is Jihad fi Sabirillah. Oh my brothers, come to Jihad and feel the honor we are feeling. Feel the happiness that we are feeling. Zainab, I wanted to quickly share with the audience that I don't know how many of you know that her father was a pilot with Saddam Hussein. So they lived in great proximity with Hussein. And Zainab, I'd like you to share that little incident from your childhood. Uh, which again shows this is one mindset. There's another pervasive mindset. And if you can share that uh, particular incident with the audience. Um, well, the story you're talking about is uh, Saddam's daughter, his youngest daughter was around the age of my brother. And at one point they were playing, kids playing, and she sat ordering her guards to throw my brother in the, in the mud. Like, you know, just, you know, with this and throw him. And my brother was crying and she was laughing. It's like more. Mind me, they were, mind you, they were eight, nine years old. And my brother was just crying. He was not enjoying, this not a game. And she would order the guards, throw him more, throw him more in the, in the mud. And it was, a, it, in a way, it's children. But in a way, there was a cruelty, you know, to, to her. Because she knew that the other child was being annoyed and, and the guards followed the daughter of the, the president. And finally, my brother at one point broke out and, and screamed and cried and ran to me. And, you know, it's, we all, everyone watched this. I watched it. The parents watched it. Everyone watched this uncomfortable scene. It was uncomfortable. It was a symbolic scene of how we were all treated in a way. And yet none of us said a word. You know, my brother ran to me, I, he's crying, I'm angry, but I, it, there is too much fear. And I think the reason you brought this experience is because in the Arab world in the Middle East, perhaps a lot of this is happening over and over again. The Arab Spring, a lot of women rose up and they were saying, we have crossed the line of fire. We have crossed the line of fear. Young women rose up, old women stood up, demonstrated, saying we want freedom. And they, a lot of them demonstrated inside their home for the same slogans that they were doing. Actually, they were putting in Tahrir Square or in other uh, squares in different countries. You know, that the, the liberation was not of the oppression of the government, but the oppression of, the, of their patriarchal system within their own lives. And these same women have been attacked, kidnapped, assassinated, tortured, and a line got crossed with them as well. From Selwa Bargigis, a major uh, uh, Libyan woman who was assassinated in her own home at eight o'clock at night with a shot in her head for advocating to vote and putting a picture and a statement on Facebook encouraging everyone to vote. That was only a year ago. Um, to many Iraqi women who got assassinated and killed and thrown in the middle of the highway. And we are in this pivotal moment where we do have a lot of women, at least in the Middle East, who are speaking up, who are rising, who are saying this is simply wrong, and they have been hurt and hit um, in a culture that you don't hit women. <laughs> you know, in a culture you don't assassinate women, you do not kidnap women. That line has also been crossed, where women now are touchable. And I feel like it's almost like the, it's the same symbolism of Saddam's daughter doing this to my brother. We're all watching silence uh, out of the fear. And, and the fear that is happening in the Middle East is that people don't know how to address it. When this guy goes and he's saying prayers I am familiar with, you know, when I hear the prophet's name, we all say, you know, and yet he's a terrorist who's killing in the name of the prophet and in the name of God. So they're hitting an uncomfortable zone within us Muslims because they're using prayers we use. They're using uh, language we are familiar with and it's, they're using it in a way that it's very uncomfortable. And so when I say that silence has to be broken, that it is a, it's, we need to speak up. And we need to speak up saying not only this is not our religion, which we're all doing right now, this is not, but we need to then take the reign of what is a religion. And, and not only be on the defense, which we are right now, yeah. but be on the offense of defining the religion because someone else is defining it for us. And women are leading a lot of that, but they're also being hit and they need that support. Do we stand up like I did with my brother or do we shout with them? 
But Zainab, you know, just before I move to uh, Lillian, we just spoke about the, re the fact that many women do want to speak up, or many people, many secular people, or Muslim believers want to speak up and reclaim the Quran. But they, there's a problem here, and if you could articulate that, which is that many of us who stand up for human values don't know the religious texts, and so you can't fight back because you're not talking to each other. So, you know, is that a problem, say, with someone like you who, you know, as a Muslim woman, do you know your text well enough to repudiate what they're doing to the text? It's an uncomfortable situation, not only because of the lack of familiarity with the text as they are using it, it's the, the authority in which you say, oh, I def it's the imam defines it is different than I would define it, for example. But also there's a lot of people who are uncomfortable with using religion as politics. So they want to make the fight about values. That's what you're saying. That they're saying, we don't want to go tete on tete on the religion because then it's a lost proposition, you know? But we want to make the discussion about values as opposed to about religion. Both because that's their philosophy. <laughs> that's sort of the liberal philosophy is we want to separate the religion from our, our personal life from the political life, but also because that's where they want to go there. And because there's a discomfort in truth yeah. of using religious texts to fight uh, this. Sure. So it's an uncomfortable situation, in my opinion, for a lot of Muslims that we have not gotten control over it yet. And I think also it needs to be acknowledged that speaking up at this moment also means real death and real violence. It's, I mean, know? there are lots of people so who are speaking up in Saudi Arabia and different countries. They're getting real death threats from ISIS. And this is no joke that people are scared. Yes. You know, you're doing this television show about changing the narrative amongst Muslim women. We don't have time to discuss that. Uh, Lillian, I, ju I just want to come to you because while we're talking about mindsets, there is a dominant sense that all the terror, most of the terror emanating in this world is now emanating out of Islam and a mutilation of Islam, but certainly Islam, and we must acknowledge that. But that is why the whole Rohingya uh, crisis is so important, because that is a, a flip face, you know, with such extreme oppression, uh, there is no retaliation. You have been working with them. Do you see a possibility of that? Again, is women playing a special role in, in uh, maintaining a different kind of face to this crisis? And what does it say that this is being driven by a Buddhist uh, community, this degree of violence? I think you're absolutely right to highlight <coughs> the fact that the dominant narrative nowadays is to speak. we tend to think of extremism uh, and terror as something which is somehow necessarily related to Islam in some way. But I think, you know, looking at the conditions in Myanmar and particularly looking at the situation not only of the Rohingya but actually also of Muslim citizens. There, there's a, a population of Muslims within Myanmar who are recognized as citizens. Uh, it's about anywhere between um, 6 to 10 percent of the population, actually. It's quite significant. Um, and in fact, I don't know how many of you know this history, but in fact, the last Mughal emperor, in fact, was exiled to Burma. And, you know, his, his um, shrine is actually still there. So it's part of Burmese history. Um, but yet there's this Islamophobia that has been... Uh, rising in a very dangerous way, exactly at the same moment when we have this so-called opening up and this transition and democratization. And I think that, um, you know, but understanding... But Lillian, why is there no violence emanating out of the Rohingyas, you know? Well, and, uh, and, the, Bur and the Burmese Muslim uh, citizen population. Um, it's, it's not easy to explain. I mean, I think, you know, many of us are actually a bit surprised. Not to say that we assume that because they're Muslims they will retaliate in... Uh, with violence, but I think um, you know the the ethos that the the Burmese Muslim um, community has is really that you know they they want to live in peace. They are a very threatened minority, and they recognise that. Um, there, there's been violence um, against the Burmese Muslim population also. Uh, in particular, this one massacre that took place in 2013, in um, March 2013, where in fact you know as Zainab, as you were talking about. Um, you know, children being cruel to children. This massacre was, um, it was awful because, you know, you had a large number of people who were killed. It was literally an anti-Muslim pogrom that was conducted by, um, you know, many Buddhists, but also, uh, you know, youth uh, who were sort of um, in a gang. But there were children who were involved in killing other children. And the, one of the worst scenes was literally a madrasa that was under attack um, about, you know, the police were supposed to be evacuating um, the children and their teachers from this 
location, and they put their truck, you know, some feet away from the madrasa, and basically were trying to create this passageway, this safe passage for the children to evacuate. And the children were made to put their hands on their heads like this and walk through this passage. And on both sides, there were, there were you know, youth from the mob, and they literally started hacking the children and burning them to death. And you had at least 30 children and four teachers who were killed just in that evacuation. Um, but in spite of that, there's still been Muslim um, leaders and women in particular who've been at the forefront of trying to create peace in that kind of situation. Can, trying can to work with one of those displaced stories? people. There's this amazing woman um, named Farida who um, is part of a movement of Burmese Muslims. Um, there's uh, an organization called the Burmese Muslim Association that actually works very much underground. And she started a small uh, humanitarian effort called Helping Hands. And she's been working um, you know, in the communities, with displaced communities, trying to help them on a humanitarian basis, but also really trying to rebuild that trust with the Buddhist population. And it has not been easy. You know, All these years she's been trying to do this, since 2013, and it's a daily struggle. Um, but she is you know, able, able, actually, to have some success. And I think that it's also important to recognize, she does this, of course, as a woman, but also the community has taken some, some very strong efforts to actually try to prevent extremism even within their own community. So for example, there have been ulama in, um, in, in Myanmar, Burmese Muslim ulama, who have issued fatwa against Wahhabism, for example, because they, they know what a threat you know, any form of extremism would be even for themselves. They know that that's not the kind of face of Islam that they want to rep uh, be represented in their country. They do not allow um, Wahhabi, um, you know, uh, they don't allow Wahhabi to pray in their uh, mosques. They don't allow them to be buried in their cemeteries or even to live in their areas. So that's something very proactive that the Muslim population is taking into their own hands. They're trying to interpret Islam in their own way, in, in a, a way that is you know, fundamentally um, in harmony with a, a concept of pluralism, which they would like to see. You know, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time, but I think that's the, a very positive story that one should end with, which is that there are other retrievable faces of religion, of communities, of approaches, of, of response to violence. And, you know, as Obi said, it's not either or, but that there, we need to retrieve a moral language that we've all lost. Um, I just wanted to quickly share a couple of things before we end this, which is that, you know, in Afghanistan, there's a woman called Shukriya Barakzai uh, who is fighting elections. And she said that, you know, much more than merely airdropping bombs in democracy, let us build democracy ground up. And that's the kind of heroic fight, which is not, again, not an exclusion, and it's not to be naive. But Fawzia Kufi, another Afghani woman whose father left her out to die uh, when she was one, one, one uh, hour old in the desert because she was a girl, she's grown up to, again, enter politics. Shukriya Barakzai has stood against her husband uh, in politics. This is just ways of fighting back, uh, of retrieving the narrative from just violence that women are attempting to do. There's again not enough time, but there was a little clip about a mother, the mother of a terrorist, of a uh, ISIS terrorist. And when you see her face, you again remember the people that we forget, which is the families of terrorists, the high emotional cost that they are paying. And again, there's a woman called Esther Schoffer who's working with the mothers of terrorists and sisters of terrorists to create uh, schools of mothers to find out what is it that we miss in our children? What is it that we forget to see when they're being drawn into this culture of violence? And those are all the additional ways, perhaps the more important ways in which we can fight back uh, on terror. So thank you so much. This was really short. All of you have much more to tell, but thank you for being with us. Yes.